Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we'll be discussing kidney disease. Set to impact approximately 37 million Americans, kidney disease is a serious medical condition and one that often progresses in severity while many patients are unaware they even have it, with only one in 10 people who have kidney disease thought to be diagnosed. To help us understand kidney disease, I'm joined by my colleague and expert in the field, Dr. Stephen Fishbane. Dr. Fishbane is Vice President of Northwell Health's Network Dialysis Services and Chief of Kidney Disease and Hypertension for Northwell Health. Additionally, Dr. Fishbane serves as a professor at the Institute of Health System Science at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research and a professor at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Steve, that's a lot of titles. Welcome to Well Said. Thank you, Ira. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So how are you feeling these days? Uh, great, great. Uh, it's a wonderful time. There's a lot of great things that are going on, so we're really excited. It's a very good period right now. Good, good. You and I were talking a little bit before we went on to uh, record this episode, and we were talking about the fact that we recently did a show on end-stage renal disease and dialysis alternatives. Our conversation today is an opportunity to talk about kidney disease more broadly. So let's start at the beginning. What do we mean when we say kidney disease? So, you know, I think a good way to think about it is that how do the kidneys work ordinarily? So the normal function of the kidneys, which we don't think about a lot, is to try to clear the, the fluids of the body, to keep the body clean, to keep the body clear of poisons, toxins. And the kidneys play this incredible role. You know, it's almost like a strainer after you've cooked pasta and you pour <laughs> the fluid and the pasta through the strainer and when it works well, it's um, wonderful. It's a wondrous thing because you could live for 100 years with the kidneys working well, but kidney disease is where that filtering, cleaning function starts to be hurt by something and it's usually a systemic disease that affects the kidneys and when that happens in its worst form, it can lead to people needing dialysis or kidney transplantation. But most of kidney disease tends to be somewhat milder, and the treatments have evolved just remarkably uh, in recent years in particular. Yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I want to ask another sort of basic question, which is when I introduced you, I said that you were the chief of kidney disease and hypertension. So what's the, what's the connection there? Hypertension being, of course, high blood pressure. Yeah, and high blood pressure can be managed by different physicians. I think a general internist will often be very, very good at treating high blood pressure, and cardiologists often have an interest as well. But for nephrologists, this has always been a very important part of what we do in terms of taking care of patients with kidney disease, because the kidneys are linked to such a great extent with the body's blood pressure and how the body controls blood pressure. Um, so that when we have people with kidney disease that we take care of, treating the blood pressure is always an incredibly important part of what we're doing. And we also have people, though, who have no kidney disease at all that are referred to us because their blood pressure has been difficult to control. And that's a different situation, but for us, it's always very interesting and very fruitful and very productive to work with people on treatments, medications, diet, and lifestyle, and, and how do we treat blood pressure more effectively. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that controlling blood pressure is important to prevent kidney disease, and the kidneys, even in the normal state, have a lot to do with controlling blood pressure. Yeah, I mean, that's well said that... Oh, I love it when people say that. <laughs> there are several organs in the body that work to maintain blood pressure, and the kidneys play a central role in that. So for patients that we have who have kidney disease, it's always a very important part of what we're doing in terms of trying to treat the blood pressure. But we also have people that are referred to us with no kidney disease at all, but specifically because blood pressure has been found by their internist or maybe a cardiologist where it's been difficult to control blood pressure. And it's always uh, very enjoyable for us and productive because uh, there's just so much opportunity to work with people on lifestyle and diet and things that could be done with treatments as well to control blood pressure more effectively. So we've been using the term kidney disease as sort of a general 
kind of grab bag of, of things. But uh, could you be a little bit more specific about what the spectrum of illnesses is that we're talking about and, and, and why is it that so many people who have kidney disease don't know it? The first part of that is that kidney disease can be a primary disease that evolves from the kidneys, and that could be genetic. It could be something that develops through life. But really, a good way to think about it is that most kidney disease is part of a broader systemic illness. So for people who have diabetes or high blood pressure and certain other chronic conditions as well, kidney disease will often develop secondarily to that. And so a lot of what we treat is in partnership when done well with diabetologists or cardiologists um, in treating patients. So that's the kidney as sort of victim, but what about kidney as primary actor? What are some of the things that are intrinsic to kidneys? And then you have diseases that are really very specific to the kidneys. There's certain hereditary diseases that children will have that um, affect the kidneys without much of the rest of the body being affected. And in adults, the same thing happens, that there are some specific diseases that happen in adults that will affect the kidneys and not much of the rest of the body. And this has been a really exciting um, last five or 10 years in that we've come to understand this part of it much better that although so much of kidney disease is just part of a larger disease like diabetes or high blood pressure, but there are these very specific um, problems that develop in the kidneys themselves, and they have very, very different treatments. Can you just give an example of one of those sort of intrinsic or primary kidney type illnesses? I'm going to give an example of something that's actually much broader and larger, which is one of the great mysteries in kidney disease has always been that black individuals are more prone to kidney disease. And that's always been um, a, a great source of concern. Why should one group of patients be affected more than others? And then uh, a series of remarkable discoveries um, over the last 10 or 15 years, which uh, will probably ne lead to a Nobel Prize, found that a specific substance called APOL1, A-P-O-L-1, turned out to be uh, present in uh, black individuals. About 17% of the normal black population have at least one copy of this gene. And it turns out that it served a very, very helpful function through evolution in that it helped to protect against a difficult infection disease called sleeping sickness, which patients would develop. But the maintenance of the gene and the protection of the gene in the population has led for black patients to be more affected by certain very specific kidney diseases. So I think that one of the most exciting areas of a more specific kidney disease has been APOL1-related kidney diseases as an example of the not typical diabetes where the whole body is affected or high blood pressure. For those folks who have the more kind of run-of-the-mill kidney disease, you mentioned high blood pressure, you mentioned diabetes. What other major risk factors are there for kidney disease? Clearly, diabetes and high blood pressure in the United States are the two leading causes um, that will be present for kidney disease. But, you know, then there's things that tend to be more related to lifestyle. So, for example, obesity is related to kidney disease and um, certain substances that people will ingest uh, can be related as well. Diet itself, I think we haven't paid enough attention to, but we're starting to learn about the importance of diet and how that could affect kidney disease as well. So, you know, I think there's a lot of factors that are there that are turning out to be important that we're starting to understand and pay proper attention to. It is, is it understood what the mechanism of obesity's effect on kidney function is? 
Yeah, it, it is. And um, one of the things that happens with obesity, especially with uh, more significant obesity, is that the overall blood volume in the body increases so that as we have more fat tissue in the body, it needs to be perfused by blood, and that's extra volume in the body. But the kidneys are still the same size as they are in anybody else, and the number of filters that are present in the kidneys to be able to clean out uh, the extra fluid puts a lot of extra pressure on the mm. kidneys. And uh, I think it's been really impressive that for people that have been successful in losing weight, that it improves kidney function, it reduces the risk that goes along with obesity. And uh, you know, this has certainly been um, an interesting period in that a lot of people, um, as we've moved through the bariatric surgery period, through uh, certainly lifestyle changes and being able to address weight through more healthy diets, and now we're starting to see medications used uh, to a much, much greater extent. And how that's going to affect kidney disease more broadly, I think it's going to be really interesting um, over the next five to 10 years. You mentioned diet. One of the things that often comes up as a question is whether excessive protein in the diet is damaging to kidneys. What's your take on that? It's so interesting. A good way to think about this is um, on why the kidneys exist in the first place. And the kidneys do a lot of jobs, and there's a lot that they're responsible for. Through evolution, you know, it does seem that the most important things that the kidneys do is to remove a specific type of chemical called nitrogen from the body. You know, to be a little bit more down to earth about it is that when we eat diets that are high in protein, the body has a lot of nitrogen to get rid of. That extra nitrogen goes through the kidneys. It increases the blood flow through the kidneys. So if I were to go to a fast food restaurant and have a double cheeseburger, a large protein meal, an hour later, the blood flow through the kidneys would be greatly increased. The pressure within the kidneys would be greatly increased. And yet, for normal people, for healthy individuals, that's not going to necessarily have a negative effect. It's not necessarily going to be harmful to the kidneys. Um, and the two things I would say there would be, one, that if somebody has kidney disease, we want to try to avoid higher protein diets because of the extra pressure that that puts on the kidneys. And yet the truth is that um, we don't necessarily know that having a higher protein diet, and there are a number of people today that do specifically try to have higher protein diets. I don't want to give the impression that it's necessarily harmful for the kidneys to be on a higher protein diet. Okay. What are the basic signs or symptoms that patients may experience as they develop kidney disease from one of these other secondary reasons that you talked about before? I, you know, I think it's one of the tricky things about kidney disease is that as the kidneys gradually weaken, so if you, let's say, have a systemic disease that's affecting the kidneys' ability to clean the blood over time, it's usually going to be picked up by blood test or other tests well before it's going to cause any symptoms at all. So the good news there is that, okay, well, there's not going to be symptoms and uh, you're going to be living your life. Uh, the trouble with that, of course, is that there's going to be that day if you're under medical care where the doctor says to you that, the blood tests have caught us by surprise, and the yeah. kidney tests have risen, and we're concerned about that. And that will be before any symptoms have developed. Whereas for a patient who maybe hasn't had medical care or hasn't come into the medical system where kidney disease has developed over the course of years without it being noticed by blood test, that's where you'll start to see symptoms, and especially if you went back, say, 50 years ago before we had treatments, before we had even dialysis or transplantation, that's where people would notice the symptoms of kidney disease. And, you know, I always have to say before I talk about the symptoms of kidney disease, don't be afraid because the symptoms that I'm going to mention, all of us experience. So it's the occasional loss of appetite, which uh, we question patients very carefully about nausea, a loss of energy, feeling tired, 
um, fatigue, itchiness, hiccups, and all of these are the kinds of things that we experience right, so pretty normally. nonspecific. Yeah, nonspecific would be the right word for it. Yeah. And nobody listening to this should hear in those symptoms, oh my God, I have kidney disease, but rather these would all be quite late in the course of disease. So more often than not, it's just something that's picked up on a blood test. Yeah, I think that's quite right. I know that doctors refer to different stages of kidney disease. So walk us through what those stages are and, and what that means. I think I would start by saying that as the kidneys are affected, whether it's diabetes or high blood pressure or, as we talked about, primary diseases of the kidney, that gradually the ability to filter the blood uh, decreases, and it usually decreases slowly, progressively over the course of time. And at some point, it was felt that it would be a good idea, rather than to simply track the progressive loss of kidney function, to put it into categories or stages. And we go from stage one, which is kind of normalish kidney function, into stage two kidney disease, stage three kidney disease, where we start to think that it's pretty likely that this is real, that this is something that could be meaningful and needs to be treated and where there's a lot of opportunity for treatment. And then later into stages four and five, which is getting closer, especially in stage five, to the need for dialysis treatment or transplantation. Um, I you know, should say here that there's been some controversy around here. It's a very well-accepted staging system, and yet it could often cause, I think, a lot of anxiety for patients because we think about staging, and a lot of people have heard about staging in reference to, for example, cancer. And when they hear that they have stage 4 kidney disease, there's sometimes a misinterpretation that perhaps I'm at very high risk, that I might be at risk for my life, say, and yet that's not really what the patient um, is facing. So we are kind of rethinking right now some mm. of the way that we talk about kidney disease and think about some of the staging and some of the language that we use. Current state is that staging is entirely dependent on just a blood test. Is that right? Yeah, so it's really a combination of blood and urine tests uh, okay. that help define uh, the National Kidney Foundation classification for the stages of kidney disease. And especially in the later stages, you're right, it becomes much more dependent on blood tests. You mentioned the therapeutic approach to patients with kidney disease a couple of times, and I heard you talk about lifestyle changes and also some medical interventions. So why don't we take those one at a time? So somebody comes to you or is referred to you and has evidence of this progressive decline in the filtering function of the kidneys, what's your advice to them about what to do next? So before we talk about medical treatments, you know, I think doctors have a real respect for the importance of our lives, the way we live our lives, uh, whether it's eating or exercise and the things that we're exposed to in our work and other parts of our life. And this is certainly important for us nephrologists, kidney doctors. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about diet and different aspects of diet that might be important in terms of kidney disease. But, you know, I'm very often, uh, I was saying to my patients that the things that I'm telling you today is partially to protect the kidneys but really a lot of it has to do with general health and how to improve general health uh, because our diets aren't always necessarily well focused on health. Um, exercise, which isn't necessarily directly linked usually and thought about with kidney disease, um, and yet I personally believe that um, it is important and it doesn't have to be doing 100 push-ups. It could be as easy as walking on um, a nice day. And um, other aspects um, of well-being, more generally, I think are all important in terms of a more holistic approach to treatment that it does include uh, medications, which really are quite important in kidney disease as well. So let's talk a little bit about that. What sorts of medications are you talking about, and what are they actually doing to help the kidneys? 
Yeah, and I would break it into two categories. So there is one category of treatments that are very specifically focused on trying to cure the underlying kidney disease. And this is more the more specific types of kidney disease that we spoke about earlier. And these are diseases that go by names like membranous nephropathy or focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. They're mouthfuls. They're not the kind of things that we talk right. about on okay. a daily basis. And yet it has been just an incredibly productive period, especially in the past five years or so, with uh, so many treatments that we have now that can effectively treat these diseases. And that's uh, remarkably gratifying for a nephrologist uh, to be able to treat a disease, not just to control it, but to potentially cure the disease as well. And then we have treatments in a second category, not necessarily specifically to cure a disease, but rather to try to protect the kidneys from the effects of, say, diabetes or high blood pressure. And here, it's been a remarkable period because there has been one group of uh, medications after another that have proven to be effective. At last year's American Society of Nephrology meetings, uh, we have a big session every year where we talk about the big studies of the year, and there must have been a 1,000 people in the room. And as we talked about some of the newer treatments and just how uh, remarkably effective they are, there was uh, tremendous excitement um, in the room uh, to the point where people were just talking uh, with great excitement about the ability to treat with some of these newer medications. And, and again, those are for folks who have uh, impairment of kidney function based on other chronic diseases. So uh, one class of these medications, which uh, have the clunky name of SGLT2 inhibitors, a lot of folks have seen commercials for these drugs on television as they've become very widely used at this point. We initially thought, well, these are great treatments for people with diabetes and kidney disease. One of the great lessons of the last couple of years has been that they work quite well, even in patients with kidney disease without diabetes as well. You know, I'm smiling because we did a show recently. We were talking about the connection between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And this same class of drugs came up. My guest was saying how great they are for heart disease, even in the absence of diabetes. Now you're saying they're good for kidneys too. Yeah. You know, I was having exactly this conversation with a patient yesterday where, for just a very technical reason, I didn't think the drug would be very effective for the patient's kidneys. And yet, I still thought that for the heart, there would be a really big benefit for treatment. There have been a couple of classes medication, of medications like this in recent years that, yes, they absolutely benefit the kidneys. They benefit generally the heart as well. And these have been major breakthroughs and uh, very exciting for us in the ability to treat people and to be able to really affect the rest of their lives. So where do you see this field going? I mean, it sounds like a couple of really promising things have come online. What, what's, what's coming down the pike? So, I mean, there continues to be great interest in trying to understand the diseases further, to be able to treat, to complete cure for kidney diseases. And I think over the next five or 10 years, uh, we're probably gonna see the very biggest breakthroughs in genetic treatments and being able to change specific genes that are related uh, to kidney disease. Uh, but really, more recently, there's been a lot of focus on the very later stages of kidney disease. So for people where the kidney disease has progressed and the ability of the kidneys to filter out the blood and to clean the blood, diminishes to the point where dialysis treatment is required or kidney transplantation. And there we're seeing uh, great research that's being done right now, both on artificial kidneys, including wearable kidneys, as well as um, research that's being done on the use of kidneys from pigs and potentially other animals as well. Uh, this is a great source of interest right now. We would rather be able to treat and to cure the disease, and I think that's where nephrology, where kidney disease is, is headed over the next uh, decade, 20 years. But having these treatments available for people that reach um, 
end-stage kidney disease or that point where dialysis is needed, uh, it's moving very fast. And I think that's quite exciting. Yeah, well, that does sound exciting. So we've touched on a whole bunch of different issues. I hope we've piqued the curiosity of many of our listeners. So where would you recommend people go to learn more about some of the subjects that we just didn't have enough time to go into in depth? You know, the internet at this point is absolutely loaded with really good quality information from medical centers throughout the world right now that are very focused on providing information about kidney disease. As always, we need to be careful because there are, you know, our sites, there's areas of misinformation that is out there as well. And anything that's read, I think, about kidney disease, it's great to be able to talk uh, soon after reading reading about it with your physician and to try to understand better in context because it's easy to look at something and maybe think that it might apply to you. But there's just a wealth of information that's out there. And I think it's becoming very, very high quality information, which I'm not sure that I would have said five years ago. Any trusted sources that you want to just plug? The National Kidney Foundation, the American Society of Nephrology, the International Society of Nephrology have made a great effort to put information out there and have it available at a very readable and engaged, I think, level uh, to be able to help in terms of understanding disease. Great. Well, Steve, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Iris. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about this today. I really appreciate it. My guest has been Dr. Stephen Fishbane. He is the Chief of Kidney Disease and Hypertension for Northwell Health, and he's also a professor of medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Thanks also to Jared Bassman for researching this topic, uh, to our producer, Connor Pilkington, and to our audio engineer, John Mullen. For more information about this program and to find all of our past episodes, please visit our website at medicine.hofstra.edu slash wellsaid. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to wellsaid at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said. <laughs>